Today's review is the Tag Heuer Monaco 2018 Golf Oil Special Edition. I have this one on loan from Saltzman's Watches, so a big thank you, a big shout out to Saltzman's. The Monaco is, is one of those watches that I have admired from afar for a number of years. And I have to tell you guys, this watch in person, on wrist, in the metal or in the flesh, so to speak, is so much fun. When you look at pictures and videos, you know, it doesn't, I don't know, maybe it doesn't look that appealing. It looks a little quirky, it looks a little retro, it looks a little loud and proud. But uh, I tell you what, having it in person, you see the nuances, you see the detail work, and on wrist, this is a, oh, this is a really fun watch. So I'm a big fan of the Monaco. I think this would go in any watch collection. It has great detail work, great design language, and a really fun history. So let's talk about the history real briefly. The Monaco first debuted in 1969. That was the year when three different watch brands were vying to be the first company to offer a fully automatic chronograph to the watch market. Those brands were Seiko, Zenith, and Hoyer. Seiko with the Pogue, the 6139 for the Japan market. Zenith with the El Primero, the first, and then Hoyer with the Monaco Caliber 11. Now there is debate as to which one of the brands was the first to start selling these to the public, but they all debuted in 1969, and I like that bit of history. Now this one in front of the camera has, a, has kind of a fun tie-in. So if you look at the dial, you'll notice a very bold stripe of orange and blue or cobalt running north to south on the right-hand side. You'll also notice the Gulf Oil co-branding or badge just above the six o'clock position. Now these two elements are paying tribute or, or homage to Steve McQueen, the king of cool, who in 1970s chose the Monaco to be his watch of choice for the film Le Mans. Now the car that he drove in the film, the Porsche 917, carried this exact same color combination, which is really fun to see. And if you look at the uh, famous photo of him on set, you'll see the uh, Monaco proud front and center on his wrist. But take a look behind that. Look at the tracksuit he's wearing. You'll see sponsors there, one of Hoyer and one of Gulf Oil. So this one is kind of a multi-leveled homage to that film, uh, and it's, it's really fun to see that there. Now let's talk details here. This obviously is a square watch, very bold, but it, it makes subtle use of circles and curves to a very, uh, just a very pleasing degree. So if we look at the case shape, very dominant, great stance on wrist, but you'll notice on the side, there's a slight barrel form, a slight arc, and that's uh, found on both sides. It's also found on the proud box sapphire crystal that carries the barrel vault or, uh, or slight arc to the top of the crystal. Creates a lot of uh, just fun distortions, light play. And if I had to pick one element, that would be my favorite element of the Monaco. I love the crystal and the way this sits in this uh, vertically brushed north to south bezel. So uh, I really like that. Again, you guys can see subtle use of curves if you look at the side profile of the watch on the nine o'clock side, the crown side, you'll also see a slight curve there, a high polished curve on the bottom of the case. And if you look at the opposite side where the function pushers are, you'll see a really intricate design, a little bit narrow on the inner side and they flare out toward the lugs with a slightly rounded polished beveled edges. So there is good real estate for your fingers when you actuate the chronograph, but again, it's making solid use of uh, linear and circular design elements. And uh, I've just found that to be uh, just a very interesting thing, an enjoyable thing as you spend some time with this watch. Now, if you look at the dial, obviously the square is the dominant form, but subset of that is your uh, circular index track, which is fun to see. Now the circular index track creates some uh, void in the dial, some real estate on each one of the corners. Now when Hoyer designed the Monaco, they implemented a horizontal applied marker that kind of juts into that void or that empty dial real estate and kind of helps fill it a little bit. So I really love that design feature. I much prefer the Monaco editions that carry the horizontal applied markers as opposed to some of the other versions that carry the perpendicular placement of the markers. I think this one is a little bit more true to the history and also enhances the design and fills the space to a better degree. 
Now there is a bi-compact layout here for the sunken silver registers. And you'll notice there is a little bit of arc or curve to the edges. Again, subtle use of square and circular form. And if you look at the hands, it's not a basic needle hand or needle nose. They're kind of blunt. They're kind of rectangular at the edge, which again is emphasizing the form here. So uh, I love the design language. I love the bold use of color, especially in this uh, Gulf Oil Special Edition. And overall, I, I'm just really enjoying the Monaco. And I personally, I would love to own one and add it to the rotation. Excellent design, excellent details, excellent history, and overall really fun to wear. Now the thing to be aware of is it wears rather large. Here it is next to the 39 millimeter Globemaster, which is a bit more diminutive on wrist. This carries the same case diameter, but because it is a dominant square chronograph, it wears and appears much larger. So on wrist, I think if you have smaller wrists, you can actually pull this off, but to pull it off comfortably, you've got to enjoy a more dominant uh, wearing sport watch on your wrist because this one does have the weight and it does have the presence. Now let's talk about the movement. In here is the Caliber 11, which essentially is a Solita SW300 with a Dubrois de Praz 2006 chronograph module attached to it. If you turn the watch over, you can see it through a circular sapphire exhibition window. This carries 59 joules, a 28,800 beat per hour frequency, 40 hours of power reserve, but that is on the conservative estimation. I've seen this one wind down at 47 hours uh, personally. So uh, it's got 40 hours of power reserve and overall very tasteful finishing here. Black polished screws, Geneva striping, micro perlage work, in bold use of red for the Hoyer logo here on the rotor. So I like the fact that Tag Hoyer, they went with the Hoyer dominant logo here on, on the, not only the rotor, but on the dial, on the crown, and on the clasp here, there is a very bold Hoyer push button to plant clasp, which I, I like seeing. It's fully adjustable as well, so you're gonna be able to get that perfect fit on wrist, and I do enjoy the use of blue and orange here. It's a little bit more of a navy as opposed to the brighter cobalt blue stripe on the dial, but it, it is uh, kind of enhancing the bold use of colors and, and paying homage to that Porsche race car that Steve McQueen drove in Le Mans. Now going back to the movement, uh, this, this uh, module chronograph movement here, it has a mixed reception amongst us watch fans. Some of us really like it. Some of us think that it's not a true chronograph and uh, kind of stay away from it. Let me give you my thoughts here. If you look at the elapsed minutes when you actuate the chronograph, you won't see a pronounced tick in between each index. This is a gradual sweep as the chronograph is engaged. And at first, I, I don't know, I didn't like it at first because it wasn't traditional. It wasn't what I was used to on a Lamania based chronograph or a Vaujou based chronograph. But the more I used it, the more I, you know, I actually really enjoy the way that operates. Now it has good action, nice defined clicks, very mechanical feeling. And uh, the base movement that's powering the, the module is based off of the ETA 2892, which is highly regarded as one of the most robust, accurate, and thin ETA movements in existence. And so far, the Dubrois de Pra module is uh, easily serviced by a wide range of watchmakers. Even though it carries a bit of a premium to service, it is, uh, it has shown itself to be a very capable chronograph. Now I looked up the servicing costs from Tag Heuer's website. It is a bit outdated. This was last updated in 2017. Now, depending on which version or type Tag Heuer classifies this caliber 11, you're gonna spend anywhere from 435 to 665 every four to five years for a complete factory service. That does not include parts though that need to be replaced. So you could be spending, I don't know, upwards of $1,000 at the higher end to service this uh, chronograph. So that's something to be aware of. It is cost of ownership and maintenance. Now let me close you off with one last thing that I really enjoy about the Monaco and that is the crown placement. So we have our chronograph buttons here on the right side the three o'clock side of the case, and then your main winding crown on the left side, the nine o'clock side, 
The reason why Hoyer did that when they released the Monaco, it was to emphasize the fact that you didn't need to wind this, uh, this movement. It was automatic winding. Again, they were trying to be the first brand to bring a fully automatic chronograph to the market. So uh, it's on the opposite side. It's uh, just to emphasize the fact that, hey, it's a secondary thing to the main attraction, the main show, and that is the uh, large function pushers on the right-hand side or the traditional side. So I really do like that. Overall, the Monaco is really enjoyable. I've, I've uh, really enjoyed my time with it. Great design, great history, great details, nice finishing, nice wrist presence, and uh, a solid addition to anyone's watch rotation. So if you wanna shop the Monaco, if you wanna get pricing, you wanna look at other Tag Heuer, Oris, Breitling, G-Shock, Citizen, reach out to Richard of Saltzman's. I really appreciate them lending this one in for presentation. And Richard's contact information is in the description along with his website. So go ahead and check it out. Thanks for watching, guys. Let me know if I missed anything. Let me know if there's any specific questions you have. And I'll see you in the next video.